Lesson two, we're going to talk about relativity and time. I'd like you to imagine that we have a cannon that can launch a baseball at exactly 30 meters per second every time. Okay? We have Sam here as our target. And the cannon fires the baseball. Boom! He's holding a baseball glove. He's standing still. What will he see? How fast will the baseball be traveling when it arrives at Sam? Pick the obvious answer here. Yep, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. Now let's add some motion to this. Let's put this baseball cannon on a van, but the van is traveling towards Sam at 15 meters per second. And now, boom, we fire the cannon at 30 meters per second. How fast will the baseball be traveling when it arrives at Sam? 45. In fact, anybody who's an athlete knows this is why if you need to throw something really far, you run into it. You add your own running speed to the velocity of the ball. It'll go a little further. Yes? Oh, same situation as number one, but this time the van is going away at 15 meters per second. And we fire the baseball this way at 30 meters per second. How fast will the baseball be arriving when it reaches Sam? 15. I hope that makes sense and that's not a surprise. Oh, and by the way, this is why if you're trying to throw something, throwing when you're running backwards is very difficult. If you watch football, for example, you'll often hear an analyst say, oh, the quarterback threw that off his back foot while he was retreating. That's why it was such a duck. It didn't go anywhere. You okay with that, Bryce? Now let's go cosmic. One of the most famous experiments in physics history is the Michelson-Morley experiment. It happened in about 1885. They thought they could do the baseball experiment, but with light. They thought what they would do is they would measure the light hitting us from a different star, the speed, in July when the Earth was retreating from the light and then repeat the experiment in January when the Earth was traveling towards the light. And in the same way we got two different answers, 45 and 15, they figured Lily, that they would get two different answers. Not as big a difference, but they felt they had instrumentation sensitive enough to d measure that difference. Got the experiment? This is the Michelson-Morley experiment. So, they thought they could measure the difference in the speed of light hitting the Earth in two situations. They wanted to measure the speed of light hitting the Earth from a distant star when the Earth was moving towards the star. They figured they would get the speed of light minus a little bit. And then they would get the sp measure the speed of light when the Earth was, sorry, the speed of light plus a little bit because head on we add them together. Then they would measure the speed of light when the Earth was traveling in the same direction, retreating from the star, and they figured they'd get the speed of light minus a little bit, a tiny bit smaller. Emily, they did the experiment. So in January, the Earth was moving toward the star with a speed, let's call it U, relative to the speed of light. The speed of light relative to the sun was assumed to be, we often use the letter C as our abbreviation for the speed of light, so they were expecting to get C plus U, and then in July, they were expecting to get C minus U. When they did the experiment, they got the same answer both times. When they did the experiment, they got 30 and 30. Uh, speed of light and speed of light. They didn't get any difference at all. How the heck is that possible? Light is special. When you measure the speed of light, you'll always get the same answer. We say the speed of light is a constant. No matter whether you're moving towards it or moving away from it, light does not behave like a baseball. You will always get the same answer when you measure the speed of light. The Michelson-Morley experiment, it's famous for its negative result. 
it showed experimentally that the speed of light through a vacuum in space will be the same for any observer who's measuring the speed of light. It doesn't matter whether the observer is moving towards the light source really fast or moving away from the light source really fast. You're going to get the same answer. So what does that mean? Turn the page. The speed of light does not depend on your frame of reference at all. No evidence has ever been found that space could somehow be used as a fixed frame of reference. Here's the short version. The speed of light is a constant. You'll always get the same answer when you measure the speed of light. Doesn't matter if you're moving towards it or away from it. Josh, it's not going to behave like a baseball. Oh, uh, what letter does the word constant begin with? So we use a lowercase c as our abbreviation for the speed of light. It's on the back page of your green sheet near the middle. How fast is the speed of light? And we're going to be using the back page, lower half, for the next few days. So 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is crazy fast. It's 2.998789.3 is what we typically round it to. Because okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, if speed is distance over time, because we said A is zero, or better yet, Declan, let's go cosmic. If speed is space over time, how can we always end up getting the same speed? Conclusion. Space and time change depending on the situation. Space and time will change so that, Diego, you and I will always get the same answer for the speed of light. If you're moving towards this, that light source and I'm moving away from that light source, we will experience different distances and different times, even though as far as we're concerned, for us, time is moving normally. Put your pencils down, look up. Come on, computer, you can do it. There are only a handful of experiments in physics that completely transformed physics. At many people's top of the list would have to be the Michelson-Morley experiment. In the 19th century, physicists thought that since sound waves travel through air, light waves must travel through some sort of medium as well. So you may have seen a video or seen the experiment where if sound is in a vacuum, you can't hear it anymore. In fact, it, they used it for a movie slogan, in space, no one can hear you. What's the punchline? Scream, is the, right? that was the, for Alien. It was a good movie slogan. But really what it means is, because sound is a wave, waves need something through which to propagate themselves, through which to flow. And so because light is a wave, it was thought that space was not a vacuum. There must be something in space. We gave it a name. You can just see it starting to appear on your screen. We called it the ether. We thought in the 1880s that space was full of kind of like an ocean of ether. And light waves came through that ether. They called this theoretical medium ether. The famous luminiferous ether this magical medium that was hypothesized to be what light required to move through the vacuum of space, just the way sound requires air to move from one place to another? How else could waves of light move through the vacuum of space unless there was some medium there, some hypothetical medium? Let's call it the ether. Ether, they theorized, is an invisible nothingness that permeates the universe. Its only physical property is that it allows light to propagate through it. But once precise measurements of the speed of light became possible, testing the predicted effects of ether on the speed of light became possible as well. 
The Earth orbits the Sun at about 66,500 miles per hour. If light travels through ether, they reason, then as the Earth moves through the ether, the speed of light should be different going with the ether than perpendicular to it. In an attempt to show the effects of ether on the speed of light, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted an experiment in 1887 at what is now Case Western Reserve University. Michelson was an expert in optical experiments and he thought that he could devise an experiment where one would be able to see the slight difference in the speed of light measured on the Earth if you measured it along the direction of the motion of the Earth and at right angles to it. There should be a slight difference. Compared to the speed of light, Earth is not moving that fast. So if you're going to check the difference in the speed of light measured with the movement of the Earth compared with transverse to it, you need a level of precision that, was, that, that no one had before. The Michelson interferometer was just such an apparatus. Michelson and Morley devised an apparatus that would detect minute differences in speed between two beams of light. This is very clever 1880s technology. Watch. Light from one source is split into two directions through a half-silvered mirror. So a half-silvered mirror is kind of what it sounds like. It lets half the light go through and it bounces half the light off like a mirror. So you can split a beam in half. These beams are bounced between other mirrors and then recombined back into a single beam. When two light beams combine, if their waves are completely synchronized, the peaks combine to make an even more intense peak. If they are one half wavelength off, their peaks combine and cancel out the intensity. Slight differences in speed between two light waves will therefore produce a pattern based on the amount of interference between the two beams. This is known as an interference pattern. So you get, and it's very easy to see with a naked eye, you get a, a, a pattern like that, or it might be shifted or blurred, and depending on how it's shifted or blurred, you can figure out how the beams are combining. Examining the interference pattern from the two light beams sent out in different directions would clearly show if the speed of each light beam were different. That's what they were expecting to see. The patterns not lining up because that would mean that they had returned at different speeds. In different directions. But Michelson and Morley never detected such a difference. Their results were inconsistent with the existence of ether. The scientific world didn't know what to make of it. The, the famous scientists in Europe, all uh, Lord Rayleigh and Lord Kelvin and Lord Thompson, were saying, hey, come on, you must have done something wrong here. Uh, there has to be an ether. And the whole thing didn't get resolved until many, many years later when Einstein came along. Einstein's theory of special relativity proposed that the speed of light is always the same, regardless of the speed of the light source. The results of the Michelson-Morley experiment were entirely consistent with Einstein's view of the universe, and this served as the turning point in modern physics. The Michelson-Morley experiment was an experimental advance in technology that transformed science. Not only physics, but science. There's a bit of a sad ending to the experiment. Uh, Michelson believed the results, morally thought that they'd made a mistake, and he died about eight years later, always telling people, no, no, we screwed up, we must have done something wrong. Light can't be traveling at a constant speed all the time. That makes no sense. It must behave like a baseball. It doesn't behave like a baseball, Sarah Ashley. It's even weirder. So we're going to use the following situation. Because light is what's behaving weirdly, Emily, let's use a beam of light, a flash of light, as our timer. Why not work it in? Suppose we have a spaceship that is emitting a flash of light. First situation, let's pretend that the spaceship is hovering at rest relative to the Earth. So it's moving through around the sun, staying the same distance from the Earth at all times. So relative to us, because we're not at rest, we're moving around the sun, but let's pretend that it's at rest relative to the Earth. Can you imagine that, okay, Bryce? And what it's going to do, it's going to send a flash of light out every six minutes. There'll be some delay for the light to reach Earth, but eventually when the light reaches Earth, a person on Earth with their stopwatch will say, every six minutes, flash, every six minutes, flash, every six minutes, flash, every six minutes, flash. 
with no motion involved, that's what we're used to. That doesn't seem very unusual. Every six minutes, flash. Every six minutes, flash. Now, let's add some motion. First of all, in 60 minutes, if the ship is sending out a flash every six minutes, how many flashes will it send out? Can you do the math in your head? 10. And in 60 minutes, Earth will see 10 flashes. And since we're using our flash as our timer, both the Earth and the spaceship would say 10 flashes, 60 minutes has gone by. Situation number two, when motion is involved, the situation is very different. Now, it's important to note that the speed of the flashes will still be the speed of light, C. This is what Einstein proposed. He said it's not going to behave like a baseball. How frequently the flashes are seen, however, that does depend on the motion because as the ship is getting further and further and further away, the light is having to travel a further and further and further and further distance to get to the Earth, and there becomes a longer and longer and longer gap. So, this, so when the ship travels toward the receiver, the receiver on Earth, so we're traveling towards the Earth, I'm sorry, the receiver sees the, ashes more, the flashes more frequently because we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and the light has less and less and less distance to travel. This happens not only because time is altered, but mainly because each succeeding flash has less distance to travel. So let's suppose we set this up just right, Ella, so that where the spaceship is sending the flash out every six minutes, Earth is receiving the flash every three minutes. Okay? So in 60 minutes, how many flashes will the spaceship send out? But how long will it take for Earth to time those 10 flashes if they're arriving every three minutes? Thirty minutes. What? But cool. We have uh, the same event, and Earth would swear, no, 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 no. That event took thirty minutes. We measured it on the spaceship. You would swear, no, 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 no. That event took sixty minutes. Who's correct? Yes, they both are. Okay. Situation number three, now let's have the spaceship retreat from the Earth. Yeah, turn the page. It's still sending out the flashes every six minutes on the spaceship clock flash. Spaceship clock flash. But because it's getting further and further and further away, the flashes are having to travel a longer and longer and longer and longer distance to get to the Earth. So let's suppose we set it up just right so that although the spaceship is sending out the flashes every six minutes, they're arriving on the Earth every 12 minutes. Okay. So six minutes, 10 flashes will take how long on the Earth? That's uh, on the spaceship, on the spaceship. 60 minutes. How long Declan back on Earth? We would say, well, that event took two hours for those of us on Earth. But on the spaceship, 60 minutes. No, it's cool. It's cool. Not weird. This means that if two events are separated by six minutes according to the spaceship clock, they can be seen on Earth to be separated by 12 minutes when the spaceship retreats at a very high speed and by only three minutes when a spaceship is approaching at a very high speed. And this leads to something that we call the twin paradox. I'd like you to imagine we have two twin astronauts, identical twins. We'll call one astronaut twin A for astronaut and one astronaut, twin H for stays at home, H for home. We're going to put the astronaut on a high-speed trip to Earth, uh, to, on a spaceship. He's going to go away really, really fast, and he or she is going to come back really, really fast. When the traveling twin returns, he or she will be younger than their sibling. Time will have moved differently for the traveling twin. 
how much time really depends on how fast you're traveling, how fast the relative speeds are. So here's our thought experiment here. We're going to apply this doubling and halving of flash intervals to the twins. Let's pretend that the spaceship twin recedes, goes away from the Earth for one hour really, really fast, then turns around and comes back to the Earth for one hour really, really fast. As far as the spaceship twin is concerned, on their spaceship clock, two hours will have passed. For them, the ship the trip will have taken two hours. However, this will not be the case for the people back home on Earth. So I've drawn a clock here, and we're going to do this together in our thought experiment. And first, we're just going to look at the spaceship, the first column. The spaceship is going to go away for an hour, come back for an hour, but the spaceship Every six minutes, it's sending out a flash and writing down the time. So 12.06, flash. 12.12, flash. 12.18, flash. 12.24, flash. 12.30, we sent out a flash. 12. 36, we sent out a flash. 12.42, flash. 12.48, flash. 12.54, flash. Uh, instead of 1 o'clock, I'm going to go 1,300 because that's going to make the math easier to just keep going bigger and bigger. Now the spaceship turns around, starts heading back for the Earth. But again... The clock on the spaceship over here says 1306 is the next time we sent out our flash. 1312, we sent out a flash. 1318, we sent out a flash. 1324, flash. 13. 30 flash 1336 flash 1342 flash 1348 flash 1352 flash we land on the earth we jump off and we greet our twin sibling. What time is it? On my watch, it is 1,400 hours. Okay? Now, let's... Yeah? Oh, 52, 54. You're right. But I still got to the right answer. Thank you. Now let's look at the people back home on Earth. Now, initially, when the spaceship is retreating... Because the light has successively longer and longer to travel, the flashes arrive every 12 minutes. So on Earth, we see the first flash at 12.12. And then we see the next one at 12.24. We see the next one at 12.36. We see the next one at 12.42. 48, Mr. Duick, 48, sheesh. See the next one at 1300. We see the next one at 1312. We see the next one at 1324. We see the next one at 1336. And then 1348. And then we see the next one at 1400. Now the spaceship, Madison, has tr turned around. Now it's coming back towards the Earth. And because of that, the light has less and less and less distance to travel. And so now we're going to see the flashes every three minutes, not every 12 minutes. So we see the next flash over here at 1403. And then 1406. 
and then 1409, and then 1412, and then 1415, and then 1418, and then 1421, 1424, 14, sorry, uh, yeah, 24, 27. And now the spaceship is landing. We run and hug each other. What time you got? I got 1400. What time do I have back on Earth? Back on Earth, I have experienced 30 minutes more than my twin sibling. I have aged 30 minutes more than my twin sibling. This isn't a math trick. I'm not doing tricksy with numbers. This is how the universe works when two objects are moving relative to each other and you start to travel at high speeds near the speed of light. Because light always insists that you'll get the same answer when you measure its speed. And so space and time will warp to make sure you always get the same answer for the speed of light. Is there a shorter way to do this? Yes, there is. And tomorrow we'll derive Einstein's famous equations. Turns out you can get them with math 8 and some cleverness. But this is how our universe works. So I wrote here, next class we will see if there's a way to calculus, calculate this time change with an equation. So is it possible to travel through time? Yes and no answering your question from a couple of days ago. Special relativity tells us we can travel into the future. The spacefaring twin traveled 30 minutes into his or her sibling's future because they arrived 30 minutes later than they left. 30 minutes later compared to the people back home on Earth. But we can't travel into the past, although there may be a way involving towing wormholes near black holes that we'll talk about in a couple of days where it might be possible to travel into the past. But traveling into the future, totally, absolutely, completely within the laws of physics. Put your pencils down, look up. Have you ever daydreamed about traveling through time? Perhaps fast forward in the centuries and see in the distant future? Well, time travel is possible, and what's more, it's already been done. Meet Sergei Krikalev, the greatest time traveler in human history. This Russian cosmonaut holds the record for the most amount of time spent orbiting our planet, a total of 803 days, 9 hours, and 39 minutes. During this stay in space, he time traveled into his own future by 0.02 seconds. Travelling at 17,500 miles an hour, he experienced an effect known as time dilation. And one day the same effect might make significant time travel to the future commonplace. To see why moving faster through space affects passage of time, we need to go back to the 1880s, when two American scientists, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley, were trying to measure the effect of the Earth's movement around the Sun on the speed of light. When a beam of light was moving in the same direction as the Earth, they expected the light to travel faster. And when the Earth was moving in the opposite direction, they expected it to go slower. But they found something very curious. The speed of light remained the same no matter what the Earth was doing. Two decades later, Albert Einstein was thinking about the consequences of that never-changing speed of light. And it was his conclusions, formulated in the theory of special relativity, that opened the door into the world of time travel. Imagine a man named Jack, standing in the middle of a train carriage, traveling at a steady speed. Jack's bored and starts bouncing a ball up and down. What would Jill, standing on the platform, see through the window as the train whistles through? Well, between Jack dropping the ball and catching it again, Jill would have seen him move slightly further down the track, resulting in her seeing the ball follow a triangular path. Does that make sense? Jack sees the ball moving straight up and down, but because the train is moving sideways, Jill sees the ball trace out a V path. All right. Now replace the ball with a beam of light bouncing between two mirrors. This means Jill sees the ball travel further than Jack does within the same time period. 
And because speed is distance divided by time, Jill actually sees the ball move faster. Jill would see the ball blurrier because for her, it is moving faster than Jack. Not so for a beam of light. But what if Jack's bouncing ball is replaced with two mirrors, but which cool. bounce a beam of light between them? Jack still sees the beam go up and down, and Jill still sees the light beam travel a longer distance. Except this time, Jack and Jill cannot disagree on the speed, because the speed of light remains the same no matter what. And if the speed is the same, while the distance is different, this means the time taken will be different as well. Because d equals dt. If you're going to get the same v, then time, and you have different d's, you've got to have different times. Thus, time must tick at different rates, people moving relative to each other. Imagine that Jack and Jill had highly accurate watches that they synchronized before Jack boarded the train. During the experiment, Jack and Jill would each see their own watch ticking normally. But if they meet up again later to compare watches, less time would have elapsed according to Jack's watch, balancing the fact that Jill saw the light move further. This idea may sound crazy, but like any good scientific theory, it can be tested. In the 1970s, scientists boarded a plane with some super accurate atomic clocks that were synchronized with some others left on the ground. After the plane had flown around the world, the clocks on board showed a different time from those left behind. Of course, at the speed of trains and planes, the effect is minuscule. But the faster you go, the more time dilates. For astronauts orbiting the Earth for 800 days, it starts to add up. But what affects humans also affects machines. Satellites of the Global Positioning System are also hurtling around the Earth at thousands of miles an hour, so time dilation kicks in here too. In fact, their speed causes the atomic clocks on board to disagree with clocks on the ground by 7 millionths of a second daily. Left uncorrected, this would cause GPS to lose accuracy by a few kilometres each day. So what does all this have to do with time travel to the far distant future? Well, the faster you go, the greater the effect of time dilation. If you could travel really close to the speed of light, say 99.9999%, on a round trip through space for what seemed to you like 10 years, you'd actually return to Earth around the year 9000. Who knows what you'd see when you returned? Humanity merged with machines, extinct due to climate change or asteroid impact, or inhabiting a permanent colony on Mars. But the trouble is that getting heavy things like people not to mention spaceships, up to such speeds requires unimaginable amounts of energy. It already takes enormous particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider, to accelerate tiny subatomic particles to close to light speed. But one day, if we can develop the tools to accelerate ourselves to similar speeds, then we may regularly send time travelers into the future, bringing with them tales of a long forgotten past. And it all comes out of D equals VT, just A is zero. But the fact that light will always insist that you get the same answer for V, which means you'll experience different times if your distances are different. Light is what we call the cosmic speed limit. Light through a vacuum, nothing can go faster than light through a vacuum. However, if light is not in a vacuum, if it's traveling through something else, it slows down. And it is possible to go faster than light through that, and you get something really cool. This is not on the test, this is just nerd trivia. <laughs> All right, here's a funny question. So this is from Jeff Sloan. And Jeff says, just an interesting thought that I had that I would like you to explore or completely debunk. If objects moving faster than the speed of sound can cause a sonic boom, is it at all possible that the Big Bang was a result of something traveling faster than the speed of light? If I'm correct, please provide an address where I can pick up my Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, the Peace Prize is not given for discoveries in physics. That would be the Nobel Physics Prize. Aha! <laughs> Just to clarify that. There you go, Jeff. Sorry, buddy. No peace prize for you, no matter what. No matter what. Uh, occasionally, a scientist can win a peace prize, but it's rare. It usually goes to a politician in power. Right. Or a dissident in power. Right. right. Uh, so, so what do you want? So, he wants to know if you can get a sonic boom, a light boom. Yes. It's basically a light boom. That's what he's talking about. The answer is yes. It's called Scherenkopf radiation. Dude, you are killing me. Yeah, yes. If you go travel, if you travel faster than light, 
there is the light equivalent to a sonic boom, where the light pulse gets gets um, builds up on itself, and it's a flash of light. It's called Cherenkov radiation. Now, but since you can never travel faster than light, right. you might ask, how does one come up with this stuff? Exactly. Here's how it works. If you have light traveling through water, transparent water, light travels slower through water than through a vacuum. Mm. It travels sl- so, so let's start. It's fastest in a vacuum. Right. It travels a little thro- slower going through air. Right. It travels a little slower going through water. Right. It travels even slower going through glass. It travels even slower going through diamond. Okay. And that, and of course, that is because it is both a wave and a part. Yeah, it's trying to get through the medium. Get through the trying medium. to get through the, And in fact, the diamond, if I remember my number, is 40% as fast in a diamond as in a vacuum. Yes, it's, it's that's slow. That's a huge that's, difference. That's what makes diamonds so cool. So if you put facets in the diamond at the right angles, right. at the correct angles, because the right angle would be 90 degrees, <laughs> at the correct angles, they, because what we call the index of refraction is so large, mm-hmm. because light travels so slowly in a diamond, that it bends back on itself multiple times within the angles that you can create on your ring, and then it shows up again in a different direction. So that's why a diamond looks like it sparkles. Because if it was only light coming from where the light came from, you say, oh, that's just the light I'm looking at. When it comes from a new angle, you say, hey, that diamond is sparkling, is talking to me. Right. So, all right, so now you have light going through all these media. Now you send a particle through there faster than that speed. Mm-hmm. That will create a mini sonic boom, except it's not sound, it's light, a mini light boom. And it was first described by... Uh, the physicist named Cherenkov, and he won a Nobel Prize for this discovery. Look at that. Uh, so, so tell him the Nobel Prize has already been sorry, been sorry <laughs> Jeff. Your, your prize has been claimed. <laughs> okay. You were right, but somebody beat you to beat the you, Wait, wait, but let me get back to the Big Bang. So the Big Bang was an expansion of the universe faster than light, but it's not the universe expanding faster than light in a medium. Gotcha. It is the very fabric of space and time itself expanding, right. and you don't get Cherenkov radiation from that. From that, okay, right, because it's actually happening in the vacuum, which is space. Uh, well, no, I mean, all of space is the explosion. It's not a vacuum within the space. Oh, okay, so the yeah. space itself is the explosion. Is the explosion. Gotcha, gotcha. Duh! Gotcha. 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 Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's awesome. Right. Okay. Uh, so tomorrow, we're going to dive into how Einstein actually calculated this. We're going to recreate Einstein's paper. We can do it with Math 8 and some cleverness. I won't make you recreate the paper for a test or anything, but I'm enough of a nerd that I have to walk through it with you. And we'll start talking tomorrow about time dilation. And it's going to get weirder, but cooler, Declan. Trust me. So no new homework today. Your homework is finish off the lesson from last day or any other missing assignments.